Good evening, and welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. As Andy said, my name is Amber Hikes, and I am the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of LGBT Affairs for the City of Philadelphia. <laughs> Woo! I bring you greetings from Mayor Jim Kinney and City Hall, where my office fights for equal living and working protections for LGBTQ Philadelphians 365 days a year. It is my great honor to introduce two revolutionary pioneers, people who are challenging our country and the world on gender, politics, and power. In this incredibly challenging time in our nation's history, we have the great fortune to witness these individuals use their unique positions and their hard-won platforms to create needed discourse on gender dynamics and patriarchy. Hannah Gatsby and Jill Soloway both show us the power of sharing a story with an audience. And I'm excited to join you in learning from them tonight. Many of us are familiar with Hannah Gatsby's groundbreaking Netflix special, Nanette. <laughs> Which shook audiences everywhere and stopped the comedy world in its tracks. And of course, we have all been inspired, deeply inspired, by Jill Soloway's brilliant mind and innovative works, including Afternoon Delight, Six Feet Under, How to Make It in America, United States of Terra, and of course, the unprecedented Transparent. <laughs> what these pioneers have in common is the reason their success is so important to our communities. They both challenge us to reconsider how we take accountability for our roles in society as we examine the intersections of our many identities. These visionaries remind us that discomfort is a necessary part of radical change. That we must not only join in the fight, but also actively challenge ourselves and each other on our experiences of privilege. It is our responsibility to ask ourselves how we can utilize our privileges, whether it's our race, our class, our age, our gender identity, our ability, our region, our education, how we can utilize those privileges to create spaces where marginalized voices are centered and elevated. Jill Soloway in particular has used their platform to increase not only the visibility of the LGBTQ community, but also to focus their attention on marginalized people within that community. They have raised our collective consciousness of transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people, and they have done so with an openness that is frankly remarkable. Their stories and the stories of their communities have pushed us all towards greater inclusion through awareness and accountability. And so tonight I ask that all of us who are privileged enough to be here in this sold out space, I ask that all of us think about what we can do to show up as intersectional allies for LGBTQ people, for people of color, for women, for immigrants, for people living with different abilities, for people experiencing homelessness and poverty, that we consider our positions of privilege as we listen to the conversation between these two inspiring individuals. Hannah Gatsby and Jill Soloway have both demonstrated the power of a personal story. And their bravery has shown us that our messy, inconvenient truths are not unwelcome. Indeed, they've shown the world that our truths are desperately needed and the generosity that honest art requires can be rewarded with real, powerful success. Not only have they proven that to the world, they have proven that to the next generation of LGBTQ artists. And for that, I am personally and profoundly grateful. It's that message that inspires me and makes the work of my office easier and more hopeful every single day. And that's why I'm so honored to be here with you all tonight. And so I ask you that you please help me provide a warm Philadelphia welcome 
just like you did for me, but, but even better. <laughs> to multi-award-winning stand-up comedian and writer, Hannah Gatsby, and Emmy and Golden Globe award-winning, Jill Soloway. This good? is natural. Um, <laughs> this is uh, my first time in Philadelphia. Thank you very much. Um, I was just posing for a photo. Um, <laughs> when I move, it just really greatly uh, increases the chances of an ugly one. Um, <laughs> Um, hello, Jill Soloway. Hello, Hannah Gadsby. Uh, we're having a conversation. <laughs> and it's going to be as natural as can be. I actually get annoyed sometimes when I go to see two people in conversation and the, you know, the per one person reads a bunch of questions and then the other answers. And I thought it might be fun if we just start this by just actually having a conversation. <laughs> yes. What did you have? <laughs> The thing you have uh, to what did you have for lunch today? That's, I was just like... Before uh, we get started I'm sorry, on the conversation, I was trying my bit. You, need, you need to know that <laughs> I'm, it doesn't matter if there's an audience in front of me or not, I'm, I'm reliably awkward in conversation. <laughs> so this isn't a performance. This is how it generally happens, isn't it? It's like, yes, let's have a conversation, Jill. What did I have for lunch today? It's time for us to talk, Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> I had, uh, for lunch, I had crudites. <laughs> We call it crudite in America. Oh, do you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Do you really? We do. <laughs> I've been saying that wrong all my life. Well, I never, I didn't, I didn't say it as a kid. I didn't have any teeth. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm a crudite Luddite. Um, what do you, how do you say it again? We say crudite, oh, like I'm the so French people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had no idea. This Honestly. whole time you thought it was crudite? Yeah. <laughs> I just read it. I don't say all the words out loud. You know? Wow. Okay. Well, there might be a few more of those. Um, I was late to language. Um, <laughs> what did you have for lunch, Jill? Uh, <laughs> um, I enjoyed some fried chicken and some french fries. We call them chips. <laughs> <laughs> like the French. <laughs> Pommes frites. Pommes frites. Okay, uh, this is going really well. Um, uh, I understand, Jill, you've written a book. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you for asking, Hannah. Where, oh, where would you get that information? From the library. No, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is our first conversation where it's just me and Hannah, and it's just, this is so fun. For us. <laughs> um, I think it's important to keep in mind there is an audience that so paid like some money. We owe some, you know... I feel like uh, we're a little lesbian Laurel and Hardy or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> they were lesbians. Um, I don't know what that means, but something to chew over, folks. Something to chew over. Um, Okay, your book, Jill Wait, Sol they told oh. us to keep the mics a couple oh. inches away. <laughs> Which really makes it natural, like, because we, you can't turn, because it... She doesn't have a lot of experience with this shape. Yeah. <laughs> I will not touch it. Um, no offense. I only came out a couple years oh, ago, so I'm so. used to these. It's no big deal. I can, do you want me to come touch yours for you? <laughs> I'm going to take it out. Um, <laughs> it's a tea drinker. Um, there we go. We do talk soon, sir. Um, okay, uh, you've written a book, Jill. Uh, it's called She Wants It. Yes. That's a loaded title. Um, let me unpack it. Why? Um, okay, She Wants It is written by Jill Soloway, who identifies as non-binary, aka not a she. Um, uh, so, so there's an issue in the title that begs a question. Also, she wants it. What is it? Thank um, you, Hannah. So there's two. Um, <laughs> and the third question that, that you know, needs to be asked is, 
How many pages is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good to know in advance, you know. You need to pace yourself. Reading so hard. <laughs> Is it big font? <laughs> oh my God, this is all I want to do, guys, for the rest of this book tour. Just you must answer some questions. <laughs> do this, do this. They're very this interested. Silly comedy act. This is so fun. Um, so the book is called She Wants It, and I went through multiple names. I, at one point, I was going to call it Will You Still Love Me If... Dot, dot, dot. Felt L a little Lana bit too Del Rey ha has that. Is that true? Yeah, this. <laughs> yeah, she sings it for about half an hour. <laughs> it's very tedious. Because at the beginning of the song, I'm like, probably, and then I'm like, oh god, not if you keep asking that. I just I won't keep loving you. <laughs> um, one of the other titles I thought about was, "What are you doing to get what you want?" That's, a, that's lengthy. <laughs> that's sort of one of the processes we use uh, when we're creating work at uh, Transparent and, and also at another uh, television show that she didn't mention, I Love Dick. The, thank you. Short-lived, uh, oddly titled. You would think I Love Dick, people would just check it out, right? <laughs> Turns out it was a show for women who didn't like Dick. It was a feminist show, and people got the wrong idea. Kevin Bacon fans turned up. They were like, what the heck is this? Um, but um, there's never been a show that Kevin Bacon has been in that has had more degrees of separation to Kevin Bacon <laughs> than that, that show. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, beyond it's true. six degrees. It's true. It's I, like um, I'm a, I have autism and I'm a literal thinker, so when I saw that title, I'm like, oh, not for me. Um, <laughs> I know, she loves art, and the show's about art and feminism, and yet Hannah hadn't seen it, so that's probably a good reason for me, to, a good clue for me to figure out that most people who needed to see it didn't see it, but. Oh, I've seen it now, it's okay. <laughs> it's really good, it's really good, but too late. I mean, I, um, it's gone. <laughs> it's one season gone. And it's gone. Um, um, but anyway, let's get back to the title of your book, which yes. is not called I Love Dick, it's called She Wants It, which has got nothing to do with Dick. <laughs> Um, well, they're both oddly similarly it's, sexual. Is it? Well, they're, they're meant to kind of grab the attention from this sort of, you think that it's about sex. So She Wants It is uh, the name of a documentary proposal that I wrote when I was in my early 20s. And as I was digging through my papers, looking at my who I used to be when I was working on the book, I found this documentary proposal and thought, I can't believe I've been thinking about gender and consent for 25 fucking years. Fucking years. <laughs> Sorry. I just like it was crazy that it was that it was on my mind then. This was way before my parent came out as trans, but I was still obsessed with gender and trying to make sense of uh, what it meant to consent as a female or from the place of a feminine uh, consenting as opposed to a masculine consent. I was already thinking in those days about when men or masculine or let's call it essentialized bodies, maleness goes towards sex, it goes in, it goes toward, and women or femaleness generally allow two totally different kinds of yeses, which have always really confused me when we talk about consent, um, because they, they feel so different from each other, I think. And then uh, I realized that, especially lately, um, she wants it is used amongst feminists and artists to talk about each other and cheer each other on. If one woman says about another, God, you know, she really wants it. They're talking about how her desire powers her art. So for me as a director, when I am making something, I have to want a particular actor or want a scene, want to use a certain lens. I have to want to see certain things. But then she wants it when said from one man to another is actually an insult. It's used as a way to justify sexual violence. And so this question of how we're supposed to connect to our desire and our power when even having the smallest amount of desire puts us in danger and makes us unlikable as females uh, is sort of the essential question of, of that title. Get some snaps in there. So it's, uh, yeah. So, queer, uh, this is the, qu the queer clap. Everybody knows that here, right? 
Do you know the? I did not know that. My audience is like half queer, half Jewish. So the queers are like this. <laughs> and the Jews are like, why is everybody snapping? <laughs> I, I, I did not know this. You didn't know the... the no. And um, when I first performed in the US, which was only this year, um, uh, early, to, early days of doing the show, I did Nanette Life. Um, uh, it was... A, yeah. Um, that's <laughs> like, you know, that's, I'm, I'm like a dog. I'm like, yes. Um, <laughs> so that's what kept happening. I, I would just be in the middle of a joke and people are like this and I'm like, what's that? Sorry. Um, <laughs> crudite. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the title, uh, is both about, uh, ambition and, uh, consent. Yeah. And shame, I think. Sh well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Talk, talk us through that. Yeah. Why is it, like, I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? Is this the first time we've talked about shame? Well, not... Yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> pretend it is. <laughs> I was going to get technical. Well, no, there was that time. Of, I think it was about three weeks ago we did have a little... Com no, yes. We've never talked um, about shame before, Jill. Let's do it now. <laughs> what did you have for lunch? I had shame. That's what I dipped my crudites into. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed, but I keep saying it. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, when it, I, I, I've been saying these words, patriarchy and white supremacy, a lot lately. And, you know, I think four or five end. years ago, you couldn't really, in a Hollywood meeting or in a professional setting, say patriarchy, white supremacy, without people going, what's, what, why'd she... What's that, you know? Um, and now I try to say them all the time and let them roll off my tongue because I want everybody to say them all the time because what they refer to is just the ether, it's just the air, it's just the, the way it feels to be alive, that we're alive in patriarchy and white supremacy. And so one of the things that I'm always telling women, people of color, queer people, people who are disabled, um, that not only have we not had access to the means of production, so we, we have been kept from access to cameras, to writing, kept from access. Uh, straight white men have, uh, you know, opportunity hoarded the gays, G-A-Z-E. -E. <laughs> Not Very said important this distinction. <laughs> if they have been hoarding the gays, it, it's, <laughs> they're often Republican senators. <laughs> They haven't been hoarding the gays, yes. but they have been hoarding <laughs> the gays. And um, so not only have we been... <laughs> visual thinker, you're just thinking of a big gaggle of gays being hoarded by In the... the closet of Republican <laughs> senators. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not from this country, so apologies. Um, so, okay, not only have you they been... You probably owe me an apology. For Trump. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to you. Thanks. <laughs> oh. Oofed. Um, okay, so they've been ho they've been taking all of the opportunities for themselves and their friends. They've been they've been offering their friends access to opportunity, and they've been producing, directing, and writing one another's work as well as their own. But also, what happens to these people I call other, who is everybody else? is that not only do we not have access, but when we do take the opportunity to say, this is how it feels to be me, and actually return the gaze, uh, look at white, straight, cis men, look at patriarchy, um, we then encounter a shaming response, meaning we get something called the male glance, which Lily Loofborough said, which means, which means a lot of our work isn't even reviewed, isn't even taken seriously. It's faced with male marketers, male journalists, male critics, male uh, social, you know, people who are running these social media. People don't find our work important. So not only do we have to fight to get that opportunity to get it made, but once we say the thing, it actually doesn't feel good for cis white men to be looked at. They don't like that feeling, so we're overcoming the shame. We're, we, we are shamed for simply uh, looking. We're, we're shamed for looking. Um, in fact, like I was, I, I was talking to um, someone today about an article where uh, Meredith Talisan, who identifies as non-binary but who's also a trans woman, interviewed Laverne Cox, and Laverne said, "This is the first 
time I've ever been interviewed by another trans woman. It was the first time. And every, you know, I meet a non-binary person and we go, oh my God, hi, it's you, it's us, look, there's two of us, and they're, ah. But, and, but know that every cis, white, straight man who has been having the opportunity of being seen by people who are him, every time he's interviewed, every time he's written about, every time he's photographed, there is a collusion, a collaboration, a corroboration around, uh, you know, making a cis, white, hetero-ness fantastic. So, so there's this, this constant kind of whipping up of you know, a propaganda around the privilege of white male protagonism that is just so everywhere that we don't see it. So for me, you know, I'm, when I hear these, you guys saying these you know, pioneers or whatever, it's, like, it's, it's surprising to me because I, every single day I fight with the thought stop writing, stop talking, shut up, don't publish this book, don't go on this book tour, what's your problem? And, and that's me, and I'm successful. So like, imagine what all of us are feeling. Do you feel that way too? Uh, Gatsby? The oh, feeling yeah. that you should just not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I have a good, I have a good editor in there. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've had a very different creative experience. Um, I had, uh, as, a, as a comedian, uh, you know, I, the audience was my gatekeeper in a lot of sense. So, uh, as opposed, you, you know, to get a television show made, there's an enormous amount of, of, of gatekeeping, you know, for that to happen. Mm. Um, there is gatekeeping in comedy and stand-up, um, but essentially, if you can make an audience laugh, you know that's, you know that's a good way to get another uh, a gig. But what I have found is that that conditioning that you're speaking of also conditions an audience. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I walk into a crowd where it's a traditional stand-up comedy club, uh, one that doesn't boo Louis C.K. off stage. That's the environment I'm talking about. Like, I have to make jokes to an audience who's just laughed at a rape joke or a homophobic joke. I have to participate with that audience. That It sounds like they've just laughed at something that I find personally horrific. So it's, uh, it's sort of, for me, I'm, I'm palpably aware of that, um, you know, I, I'm calling it conditioning or, mm. or that, sh that shaming. And that's why in my show I talked about self-deprecation because that was me playing the game of what, you know, well, I know what these jokes are. I know what my stereotypes are. Uh, I have to play to those in order to be accepted, to be heard before I can even get to the joke. Um, so it's, for me, it's about the amount of effort that it has to, that it takes to just get to the starting line mm -hmm. before you've even said anything. And that, you know, uh, you know there's all these measurable uh, hurdles. But then there's also the ones that are so deeply woven into the fabric of your self-identity. Uh, for me, you know, being raised uh, in a very homophobic place, that was internalised homophobia that was so deeply woven into me, I didn't recognise it. Mm. Um, so I think it's even beyond, you know, the, the sort of, like I say, uh, measurable hurdles. Uh, you know, and the shame that you're talking about, this self-editing, I shouldn't write this, how dare I speak, is I think, you know, I think we're experiencing a moment where <laughs> suddenly we're speaking and instead of having the world push back like we're used to, we're actually hearing a chorus. Mm. And that's, that's something to be, uh, I think, has shifted for me. Yeah, truly. Um, well, that's a great conversation. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm also, like, I'm also very aware that there's several men in the front row here. Um, and I'm sorry, fellas, but it's making me giggle a little bit because, you know, this is, must be hard for you. Is this hard for you? To do? It's not? That's privilege. <laughs> <laughs> That's privilege because whenever I was in an audience and there'd be two straight men just talking about the lesbians, it was hard for me. So this is good, yeah? We're, uh, this is called good. Um, thank you. Thank you for 
for not finding this hard. <laughs> and admitting that. That's good, though. I like it. That's, that's cool. What about you, mate? <laughs> you all right? Yeah. How are you finding this, sir? Uh... Hmm? A little bit. A little bit? Hard. A little bit hard? Yeah. <laughs> Is this your wife? Is this your wife? How are you finding it? Fine. Yeah, <laughs> fine. You two have a chat later. Maybe, maybe you can learn something off your wife. She might be able to talk. Um, no, I'm joking. That was a joke and unfair, unfair. But um, <laughs> oh well. No, um, <laughs> I said crudite. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, sorry about that, mate. Um, uh, uh, you know, life's hard, you know. Um, <laughs> comedy. Um, right, uh, who, would you like another Oh, yes, question. Yes, this is yep. in conversation okay. about my book. Yeah, so I've read it. Yes. Because um, it was a good length. And um, <laughs> it's not a difficult read, so. Um, I'm sorry, I should, now I've started. I, I really... Apologies. Um, anyway, so it's a good read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, there's something in, I, I love when you talk about beat changes. I want you to tell okay. people about your ideas of beat changes because it's a, you know, I'm assuming not everyone here has made a television show. Um, like it's a, it's, a, it's a definite skill, the, the skill set that, that people don't have. So I want you to, I want you to explain beat changes and and then we'll move on to how you think about consent in terms of that. Oh, great. Okay, good. Yeah, a lot of the things that um, I think about ended up sort of getting braided together in this book, like a delicious challah, um, a beautiful egg-brushed bread. You know what challah is, right? Never knew how to say it, though. Um. <laughs> Um, and so we use the, a process at work, and I, I often teach it to young filmmakers or to any artists who are looking for a language. When I first started making my film, I took a class with a woman named Joan Shekel who taught me her technique. And essentially it boils down to four things, action, beats, beat changes, and blocking. An action is an emotion, which is a verb. It's a verb you can feel. This is kind of sort of classic Stanislavski, Stella Adler stuff. Actors are playing any, an action in any moment for a length of time, which is a beat. Then there's a beat change, and then the character now is doing something different to get what they want. So an action is a, is a verb you can feel that you're doing to get what you want. A beat is a unit of measurement, like in music, and then a beat change is when you, you change what you're doing to get what you want. And one of the things that Joan Shekel taught me is that every, uh, the, the beat change happens for everybody in the room at the same time. That's something that she brought to this conversation about action and beats, and she's really been an amazing teacher for me about process and technique. That was a beat change. That was a beat change. <laughs> Did you all feel that? That was an easy one. <laughs> I'm so sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. I keep pointing you out. <laughs> Nobody knows it's you, except your wife. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did it again. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Beat change. When that laugh just ended and then I started up again, another beat change. So a beat change is, is kind of a moment that everybody in the room can feel. And so both of the characters feel it at the same time. And when we're making our work, I feel it as a director. The cinematographer feels it. Actually, the ADs feel it. Everybody else in the scene feels it. We name the beat changes when we're in the writer's room. We prep before we shoot around the beat changes. And then... Can I have an please, example jump in. of a name? No, when, you, when you name a beat change, yes. what sort of... What sort of name are you giving it? Oh, well, we, we, we map the script. So, for example, uh, you know, the, the, we, if, if you were I and I were doing, um, we're playing a beat. I, I'm playing talking right now. You're playing listening. That Don't would be... play it very well. <laughs> <laughs> I play interrupting. Sorry, as you. But... Yeah. Well, we don't name the beat changes. Oh. We, 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 we find the exact moment. So sometimes they're between words, sometimes they're between lines. It's, it's, it's like the moment that 
I, I describe it in the book as like if it's a hockey game, you know, there's a, there's a player and he sees the open puck and he heads to the open puck. So it's sort of the moment after you see the open puck and then you decide to do it. It's the moment be before you decide to move. It's the moment before you decide to move. And that's why it generates blocking. So what we do by mapping out scripts into these actions, beats, beat changes, and blocking, and you know, there's no exact right place, but the idea is that we're all doing it together. So it's like, we'll open the hood of the car, we'll, we'll look at a scene together and we'll ask ourselves, does it happen on this word or on this word? So what we're doing is we're creating a consensus around what we're all doing there. And by having this framework, call action, and when we're shooting, now we're all in this kind of almost agreed upon free dance that has very clear beat changes. So we know what we're heading for and we know when things are gonna change. And so that's why I think um, some of the stuff that we're doing at Transparent looks and feels a little bit different than what you'll see on other TV shows. What you're looking at on other TV shows sometimes is a script that a writer has written who's gone down to the set to make sure that the actors say the exact words they wrote. And a director has been hired to photograph the actors doing the script. And sometimes the director will give the actor some feedback, but again, it's based on what the director thinks. So it's very like qualitative. Did the director like it? And so what's happening on the set is there's a group of people who are all hanging around, or they're working, but they're working with this rubric around them of, we better do this quickly because we don't want to go over, which means uh, we don't want to spend more money than we have to. So there's kind of like people standing there with arms folded making sure that it's not taking too long or costing too much. So that's kind of like the headline of most sets. And then there's, we hope dad's happy, which is the other headline. The director, usually male, kind of arms folded, staring at the monitor, you know, expecting something to happen and then kind of sometimes fist pumping when it goes right or moving the people like on the monitor with their hands like to get something right that the director thinks must be right. But we're doing this other thing which is a little bit more like street theater where an imp improv where the actors know the lines, they're there for them, but when we say action, we're actually hoping for everything to be unexpected. We're hoping to completely surprise one another, and we have the freedom to do that because we know that we're about to careen around a post that we can all see, which is the beat change. So that's, that's how I use beat changes as a director, and I offer this technique to everybody. It's really quite simple, and for a lot of people that I've taught, they said, you know, like this technique is, ha, has been my way of directing, and for me it was my way to start directing, just sort of understanding my work through that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. I think it's fascinating because often, uh, uh, just as a, as a human, I, uh, I don't even walk into a room going, what do I want out of it? More like, I just hope I don't make a mistake. Like, that's how, that's so, like, it's uh, even just sort of, uh, we've been talking about beat changes. It's, it's changed the way I've even entered the room as a human going, what do I want out of this room? Um, yeah. I don't always do it. Um, <laughs> But it, I think it's a it's a really you know fascinating way that you've talked about it in the book in terms of consent. Oh. Yeah, that's something that somebody said to me. I was speaking to a friend of mine who read the book, and she said, "Well, it's amazing how you kind of like laid laid out this stuff about the fact that the beat changes are where consent happens." And I hadn't really thought about that. I hadn't really thought about like that a feminist filmmaking style would be very clear around the moments where people are deciding to go from one way, of work, one way of getting something to the next. And the more I started to think about filmmaking and consent and, and what the female gaze really is, um, I kind of started to think about, you know, not only regular film and porn, both- Oh, that was a big change, sorry. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> they all edit out female consent. They all edit out female consent. So we all know the uh, trope of like the pizza delivery guy, hey, I got the pizza, and then you cut to the sort of, you know, dirty part. And, and you, and you haven't seen that one? No, I haven't seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, 
this thing called pornography. No, it's no, everywhere no, no. in no, the no, United no. States. Oh, no, no. We, Do you I guys have that it, in no, Australia? No, it wasn't that. I just called it pipe set. <laughs> <laughs> the pipe set man's here. <laughs> But so, you know, everybody knows that, like, of, cor of course, in this stuff that's, like, raunchy, you know, a a consent is always edited out. But, you know, even in regular TV shows that we all grew up watching, the sort of typical love scene that we have in our head is, like, two people maybe meet across a crowded room, and maybe they, they might start, you know, making out. But then you'll cut to them in bed, and they're going at it, and then you'll cut to them in the end, and they've got, like, the sheets pulled up, and, like women's consent has been edited out of portrayals of sex think, for all television I think my, my and movies. My favorite one was Casablanca, where I think she fainted and it just cut to a phallus build, like just a, a building cock. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you remember that way? She's like, oh gosh, you're, you're a man. And then they're like, yeah, I am. And then edit, and it was just like, you know, you know what I'm talking about, sir. Um, <laughs> it's a hard building. Um, <laughs> how did you, s I want to ask your wife, how did you sell tonight to him? What did you tell him was going to happen here? <laughs> You're like, we're going to go out to a thing. And then what did you say after that? <laughs> oh, you, you dragged your wife here. That's probably not oh. the best turn of phrase, but... Um, <laughs> 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 oh. Sorry? Okay, yeah, you got consent. Thank you. Yeah, of <laughs> yes. course you did. Of course you did. She seems very comfortable. This is a good relationship I'm witnessing here. Um, but yeah, no so, so this, this question of consent and femaleness and femininity has been this thing that's been obsessing me as I've been sort of letting go of my femaleness one curling iron at a time. I used to um, spend a little bit more time getting ready and looking feminine and even being heterosexual. I spent more time doing that in the past. Um, and <laughs> did I tell you that I used to be straight? No, I read it in the book. <laughs> um, it's a very informative book. Actually, you know, like it's, it's quite the journey in the book, but you started writing the book when you were... I sure did. Uh, I was married uh, and, and hetero. Identified as, as straight. You're yeah. in a relationship. Uh, married. with Married. Um, and you wore the makeup situation. I did. Um, and, and, and then as you were writing the book, that, that also changed quite a lot. It all started quite, to like quite fall old. away. But as it all started to fall away, I really was looking back at like decades of, of heterosexuality and, and realizing that like when I was dating men, I was doing a fake personality uh, to make them feel better all the time. And the fake personality was I wasn't talking. I don't think I was talking in this voice. I think I was like talking in, in a little bit more like I think I was trying to make space around them and make them feel like their desire mattered more. Um, and in fact, we, we've been trained, we were trained as girls and women that you have to be very, very careful not to quote unquote want it. Um, that you have to, you know, make the man think he's chasing it. Like there are all these ways in which women are trained to kind of be convex, and it just make it not hard for the just well make men, not make it hard actually. The other oh no, I'm talking about <laughs> just difficult, not golly. Oof. Um, <laughs> No, we've gone there. So, I, I, but when you're talking about this, though, there's the issue of uh, being feminine uh, in 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 uh, you know conversation with masculine. But then there's also the issue of your your own identity and how that sat with you. Like, so it's not just that uh, you know your sense of self changed as well. Yes, so I, I don't want to be femme shaming. I think it's great to be femme, and I'm glad that there are femmes. Like, yeah, let's let's all snap for. Honestly, I think I just realized that I wasn't one and that I, it was compulsory and I had, I had started doing it without anybody ever helping me figure out if it was what I wanted to do. Um, I speak in the book about high school and just like getting these gigantic breasts which are now gone, but um, it, you know, I turned, I, I turned in, within the course of a year into... You didn't just lose, like... No, I didn't lose them. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know where they went. Uh, I have no idea. Have you guys seen them? I mean, the, uh, Did I leave them at a Philly cheesesteak <laughs> restaurant? Trying to make it local. <laughs> make this joke local. 
I had breast reduction surgery. That's I would have gone with went. a soft pretzel <laughs> reference. <laughs> no, they're gone because I, you know, it, it, it was interesting. After my parent came out as trans, for some reason, I, I, I said to, I, one of the many things that I thought besides, uh, I, I'm going to make a TV show and I love you and I'm proud of you. Um, but one of the other things that happened was I had this instantaneous idea of like, I don't have to have, I don't have, they were huge guys. And I was really carrying a lot. It wasn't just the weight of them. I, I meant something. I meant something to other people that really preceded my ability to mean something to myself. And that was, uh, that was, that was overwhelming. Tits on a stick. Isn't That's what the, that was my nickname in high school, guys. Yeah, that wasn't me just going there. Let's give a... <laughs> Let's conjure up an image. Um, it happened really fast. Like I had an adolescent body. Bless you. Then, you know, it all happened. Turned 16. Got my period. Huge tits. The rest of me was like a child. I looked like a cartoon. I had the opposite pro. The, when, I, <laughs> when I, you know, went through the puberty situation, yeah. um, the breast fairy had a roster day off. <laughs> and uh, I got a visit from the thigh fairy who doesn't... <laughs> It doesn't get it, you know, it doesn't get the gig that often. And so it's like, I, I really want to make an impression. And so it's just like, I'm really going to do a really good job on this. And I just, just all of a sudden, like, got these massive hips, which was just the, just, I look back and i like, that's a cruel joke. It's just like, as if puberty's just gone, let's turn this one into the ultimate baby carrying vessel <laughs> and then give her absolutely no desire to make one. Like none, <laughs> ever. It's like I'm a transformer that doesn't fancy driving. <laughs> but <laughs> so this is, this is the, but I think this all comes back to it the idea back to of, we both, of yes, what, suffered. but what it means when somebody looks at a woman and what a limiting range of the biological yeah. female situation actually does in the minds of people, what it actually means that to be female bodied means that you are uh, it's just such a, uh, you know, just a narrow range of desire, at, well, none of that, but you know, it's a, it's a meaning. Uh, being yeah, well, you're, you know, being female bodied or, or femme presenting or feminine uh, makes you less likely to believe, to be believed around your own consent. I mean, that's one of the sort of like, when we're like, what is the air? What is the water? What are we talking about? If you are female, femme or feminine, you are not trusted about your own consent. And that's what's, that, that's what I think is one of the things that I feel like, um, I wish people were talking about instead of this, like, you know, did she or didn't she, you know, he said, she said, like, let's just remember when we're trying to talk about these narratives around consent, that the more feminine you are, the more female you are, the less likely you are to be believed. That's not why I dress like this. I mean, for me, being non-binary is a little bit of a protest. It's a little bit of me just wanting to step out of... All, all, all of the expectations that go with being a woman and kind of just be like, give me a second. Uh, but one of the things that I talk about in my book is um, when I see myself as a parent, if I, when I, you know, I, I do these thought exercises, like being non-binary has allowed me to do these thought exercises where I think, you know, what if, what if I was a man? What if I was a dad? If I was a dad, if I was a gay dad, what if I was a gay man and a dad or, or, or a cis man and a dad and like look at what kind of parent I am. I get home at six every day from my really high powered job. As a man, I have dinner with my children. I put, I put my kids to sleep. I read to them every night and in the morning drive them to school. I mean, what kind of an amazing trophy receiving man would I be? But then when I see myself as a mom, I see these kinds of failures. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a room parent. I didn't make a the what? food. <laughs> a room parent is like crudite. Oh. Um, no, a room parent is a mom who's involved at school. You know, I didn't, I, didn't make his I didn't make the food that's in his lunch. I kind of just like tried to put something together, but there's nothing homemade it's in there. It's food, though. I didn't, but I didn't make <laughs> dinner. I didn't like... Cook Food's a win. The dinner. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of kind of emotional labor around the idea of a mother, which is that you that is that you're going to make nourishing meals, 
that, that you like to cook for your family, that you want to make a homemade Halloween costume, that you, they, these things around mother where I actually am a total failure when I see myself through that lens of the expectations of women, I, I, I can see that I'm just kind of not cutting it in a million ways every day. So I think for me, the, you know, moving into this non-binary identity has helped me just move out of all of the ways that uh, women unconsciously take on um, these assignments about holding emotional labor for people. I, I'm no longer like a kind of uh, angry woman. I'm just a talkative human. Yeah, you're no longer mouthy. Mouthy. They used to call I, uh, me a mouthy broad. <laughs> I, I used to, you know, the magazine articles that say, can women have it all? And I'm like, I struggle to leave the house. <laughs> like, I just, <laughs> there's issues. No, no, and men don't have it all either. You know, there's, there's a lot of work gets done on that. Sometimes they don't even see. Um, not, not their fault, but, uh, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> Beat change. Look, I am. Um, we're gonna open the the this up to this conversation up to actual questions from other oh, yeah, actual guys, human beings. Hi, uh, my name is Zoe. Uh, thank you both for coming out. Um, I'm a I'm a trans woman, and uh, I want to say, um, watching uh, Transparent over the past years uh, um, was an amazing portrayal of, of Judaism as a trans Jew, uh, and I appreciate that. Um, one thing that really, really transformed me was in, um, the, the whole narrative of Weimar Germany um, in season two, um, basically talking about trans history, right, and the Institute of Sexualisenkraft and um, the trans movement that happened in Weimar Germany in the 1920s before um, Hitler came to power. Um, that was the first time I'd ever heard about it. Uh, I'm actually writing a graduate paper about it now, so thank you for that. Awesome. Um, but so I was wondering, right, because as, you know, as we all know, right, the 20s ended, 30s happened, the Nazis came to power and destroyed all this sort of history. And I was wondering, you know, as someone who, who wrote, has you know, directed and wrote about this, what you think about the role of history and how we're having these, right, these conversations, right, about you know, patriarchy and about, uh, like, um, the ways in which trans people are treated and like this unquestioned narrative is that, well, transness is something new that we're talking about, but it's actually not. And I was wondering if either of you had thoughts on the ways in which who controls history determines how the conversations that we're having. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Thanks, sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I really appreciate it, and thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I, I uh, was also so surprised to find out about Magnus Hirschfeld, who uh, had a place called the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft in Berlin just before the Holocaust, and Magnus was one of the first people to be doing gender reassignment surgery, and really uh, you know, wrote books, uh, had a book called The Third Sex, was doing an amazing amount of research, around trans and non-binary people, and was actually used by Hitler as one of the first people as the face of what it meant to be deviant. He was connecting up, Hitler connected up Magnus Hirschfeld and Judaism uh, to create this caricature of the deviant Jew. And Hirschfeld ultimately uh, had to leave uh, and, and while he was gone, he was, you know, burned in effigy in the square, in the tear garden. Um, brown shirts came to the institute and took all of their research books and things that were in their library and brought them out to the square and burned these books. Um, in the salon where Hirschfeld was, was having talks, Margaret Sanger was there. Christopher Isherwood was there. This wasn't that long ago. This was people who were doing the exact same kinds of things that we're doing right now, the queer people who are asking for and begging for a radical difference in, in how the world is seen. And I, I'm very much reminded of that time right now and very much feeling that Trump is a fascist and using this kind of humiliation of the other as a way to gin up, um, gin up his, you know, his, his side. It's, it's, it's so obvious to me that I feel like 
boy, oh boy, can't we just find a way to say this, how the fascism is, be fascism is being used. This, uh, you know, I'm always looking for this narrative. That's why I say white supremacy and patriarchy together all the time, so that women and people of color, as well as trans people and queer people, can all name back to power how the way that they are otherized uh, allows people to feel better about themselves. You know, Trump, asking a whole stadium of people to laugh at Rosie O'Donnell is Hitler. You know, this is, this is the otherizing, you know, at least we're not her, at least we're not a woman, at least we're not a Jew. We're, you know, it's, it's a really, really scary moment. Hannah and I talk about this all the time. That this, we're fun this, to hang out with. We really are. <laughs> Small talk, fascism and consent. <laughs> Do you want, should we talk about fascism for a moment? Because it's so important right now. Well, I, I am an art historian. Um, can I get any more fascinating? Um, <laughs> that's what I, I studied art history. And I was, as this last few years, uh, you know, I, would, I studied sort of uh, um, interwar art, modern art. Um, so I was always, you know, particularly the surrealists. And I would, I would look at, you know, I know that time. She's leaving because you're talking about art. Yeah. Okay, oh, that's fine. That's okay. Um, <laughs> enjoy. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I just see so many of the same things happening. You know, like the same. You know, uh, and I was, I was just stuck with this thought. It's like we know what happened. Like hindsight, we got some. We know what not to do, and yet we seem to be doing it, you know, these, th these same things are popping up, like, you know, there's so much of what Trump is doing echoes so closely to, to Hitler, who was a joke for a long time. Let's not forget that. People laughed at Hitler for long enough for him to dismantle the, the structures that were in his way. Um, so, and what I come, you know, what I keep coming back to is a lot of those artists who were fighting fascism. Uh, and I would I study those artists, and they're men, and they hated women. They they art actively, you know, objectifies women, mutilates the bodies of women, uh, you know, object uh, you know puts their desires onto sleeping women, uh, within their circles, you know, that they were active in. They would uh, diminish the roles of women you know, who were equals, artists equal to them, but they were silenced, pushed aside, forgotten, written out. And these are the men who were against fascism. And so my thought is I think history is repeating itself because you can't fight fascism with fascism. Mm. And I think, yeah, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> I have thoughts. So, we, you know, I think there's a lot of anyone who's an other, and it doesn't necessarily mean that every straight white man is deliberately doing this. This is structural violence. We're participating and we were all, we've all inherited this. Nobody in this room invented this structure. We've inherited it. But that's what it is to be other. You're living in what has been written. It's basically you're, you, you're disempowered. We're living in a, you know, being oppressed. Our, not everyone has autonomy. That's a small thought. Take that one home. <laughs> Stick it in your pipe and smoke it. Not all. It's Sometimes a, a pipe's book. just a pipe. There's jokes in the book. It's funny too. Oh, there's a Hi, my name is Robin. And after the last question, I don't really feel smart enough to ask a question. <laughs> I, said, enough. I said crudite. <laughs> <laughs> but you're from Australia. You're allowed. <laughs> or excuse me, Tasmania. <laughs> Um, that... Actually, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't um, have such a great question, but after seeing both of your work, um, your work, Hannah, much more recently, um, I have just felt so empowered by what you have put out there, mm. and I just really wanted to say thank you. Mm. And um, on your art history tape, um, I um, have, didn't study formally, but I'm a student of art history, and one of the things I love the most are the snippets you've put on YouTube, and I'm desperate to know if you're gonna do any more, because they're wonderful. Mm. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, the, the Renaissance woman, 
uh, clips, is that what you're talking about? No, no, they were a lot of work. Um, <laughs> and I didn't get paid for them. And, um, you know, this body doesn't just happen. I gotta eat. <laughs> um, <laughs> crudites are expensive. Um, but, uh, the, look, I, um, I, f I frame uh, a lot of what I think about and how I think about things through the lens of art history. So I think whatever I do, I think will will certainly... Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jen, and um, I'm a professor at Temple University here in Philly, and I teach gender and sex. And uh, Hannah, yeah, I temple. just actually showed your stand-up. Sorry, stand -up. you teach gender and sex. Yes, I have a PhD in human sexuality. Okay, nice. so, <laughs> oh, right, that's great. It's just like, um, but sex, as in, like, what do you... All of it, the, the politics of it, the sexual okay, great, agency great, of great. it, gender, not hands on, the orgasms, not hands on. the pleasure. Theory, the theory, kink, theory. No, all, practice, you name what? it, whatever. Okay. All of it. Uh, <laughs> sex and disability, sex and everything under the sun. But, but I think that for me, sex education um, has connected me to more than anything is vulnerability and empathy. And I think both of your work is so full of that. Um, and I think that's why it's so meaningful. I know mm -hmm. that... Um, for uh, all the folks in my life that have seen Transparent, um, and now for all of my students that have seen Nanette, um, I think that for me it's an incredible demonstration of the power of empathy education. Mm. And I'm wondering what the future um, looks like from your vantage point, being so connected to being part of that media, in terms of being able to create and produce more empathy and building more bridges. How can we get more people to do that and how can we get more people to punch up instead of constantly punching down? I think, I think there's a always a reminder that empathy feels good. Um, I think, look, I have, uh, I have autism and I was very late in life diagnosed. Um, and that made life really difficult for me. And part of what delayed the, you know, the diagnosis and also my understanding of it was this idea that people with autism don't have empathy. Um, I, ha I have a lot of it. Um, and I, I can, I'm very aware when people feel bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, know, I don't feel good, even though I keep stepping on the... But, you know, I, do, I, don't, I don't want people to feel bad. I, 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 but... This idea that the show Nanette was is, was pretty much about that in in uh, without saying it directly, um, and I think that's really all you can do is to remember yourself, you know, to feel empathy. And what is makes it so difficult in this moment in time is a lot of people who are in pain, you know, and are disadvantaged, you know, when you're faced with hate. It is one of the most difficult things not to mirror that hate, especially when you're from a disempowered, disadvantaged position. But that is really the only, the only option because the only way to diffuse hate is to step away from it, is not to match it. But it's always those who are in the most difficult position, always those who are in the margins who have to be the strongest. Mm. Um, so I think... You know, personally, it's just just to remember that it does feel good to have empathy. Whereas, you know, other than that, no fucking idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to say a few things about that. So I'm part of this organization called 5050 by 2020. We're a strategic initiative of Time's Up. And uh, whereas m much of Time's Up is concerned with safety and equity in the workplace, and in particular making sure that people who need legal defense have access to the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. We're working on this sort of other aspect with Time's Up, which is making sure that women, people of color, queer people, other otherwise people have access to uh, making things. Because as you know, Roger Ebert, he said, um, film is an empathy machine. So that when you sit in the seat of the protagonist, you are empathizing with them. You're, 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 you're feeling them. You know, in, in many ways, it was annoying when we, I realized that we all had so many movies that we all went to where women were expected to empathize with uh, male protagonists to be able to enjoy movies. Um, but it's, 
you know, I think a lot about this idea of leading with vulnerability, like actually, like the feeling of vulnerability in the body, because is you know, in particular for um, straight men, cis men, white people, um, I think I've noticed, especially for men, there's a feeling that they've been trained with to um, enter a room and then sort of convene reality, summarize, name, ask a bunch of questions, let everybody know, here we go, and now we're done. And it's mansplaining? It, 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 but I, I don't think it's men's fault. Oh. I think it's just what, what they've taught masculin they've been taught masculinity is, which is like make sure everything's okay. So, so make, you know, ask people, you know, say, say the things that need to be said, and then when it's, you know, and what this does is I think, um, you know, what, what are we asking for when we're asking people to center people of color, when we're asking people to center trans people? It means making space around letting those people define reality. And so what does that literally mean? It literally means, you know, not assuming uh, when you meet somebody who is different than you, that you get to just start, um, you know, asking questions about their difference, bringing up their difference, naming their difference, outing their difference, because it, you know, it, it's. It, I think people think of it as curiosity, but it's actually centering. It's white centering or it's cis centering. Yeah. I've had people, a lot of people, say to me, um, bless, "Bless you." You know, uh, as I've gone uh, down through this journey of not wanting uh, to identify as female anymore and not necessarily wanting to identify as male and, and finding this non-binary journey. And so sometimes some friends of mine, you know, so I'll, you know, I'll say I'm, I'm identifying as non-binary and, you know, I was having this conversation. I'm thinking about, you know, I'm, I identify as trans now. And I'll have like some friends of mine go, you're not trans. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You know, like they're trying to do me a favor, you know, they're trying to let me know that I'm okay, I'm like them, I'm cis. Um, that's just like this kind of like reaction I think that people have. Like you, like you don't have to be this thing that you just think you just found out you are. That's not a good thing. So even I think in the, the best of intentions when people are just sort of like quickly trying to say like, you get to be one of me too. Like it's actually like this incredibly offensive statement. You know, it would be like saying to somebody who's biracial who identifies as black, like, oh, but you can identify as white, you can pass. Like people want me to be cis um, and they openly ask me and invite me to be cis, um, and that's them just trying to be nice. But it's a really, it's a really, you know, egregious expression of privilege. Um, so I think, yeah, the ways that we express our privilege um, by just centering ourselves, whether we're white or cis, can just be incredibly painful to those around us. So I would just say, a real cure for that, I find, is that vulnerable feeling of entering a room, and then holding space for silence where you're not in charge of the conversation and allowing somebody who isn't white and cis to just lead in a room. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, Is that too much to ask? Is that like... Oh, it's just like physically... No, we've got some clicks. I okay. think it's perfectly reasonable. <laughs> I don't know. I think there is that thing, I think I'll, 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 we all uh, do this and we're all, you know, uh, you know, often pointing out, you know, it, it is well-intentioned, we say that. I, you know, didn't mean to offend. But I, I think it's good, to bless you, I think it's good to uh, remember that it doesn't matter how well-intentioned it is, it always hurts. It always hurts. It is never not painful to be reminded that you don't belong. And that's, uh, I think, I think it's so important to just try and find, you know, what, what is in common, which is generally, we've all had lunch, start the conversation there. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Later in the day, it's weird if you start, early, like it's first thing in the morning, don't go, what have you had for lunch? <laughs> you know? Hi, my name's Nathaniel. Um, this question's for both Jill and Hannah, but it's really inspired by uh, some things that you said in Nanette that I was kind of connecting. Um, at one point you talked about comedy as, um, sort of manipulating tension and creating and relieving tension and that that was something that you learned to do from childhood. And I wanted to hear more about your process, also talking about leaving comedy, um, hmm. about how we 
like as people learn to cope with stress in particular contexts, in particular ways, and then that context shifts, and then those patterns of behavior don't necessarily fit as well as they used to, and then that process of like learning to recognize that and then changing those behaviors. Um, that was a lot of what I was getting from Nanette, and I wanted to hear more from you, Hannah, and also from Jill um, on yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Okay, I think I've got it. Um, no, no, sorry. Um, well, first of all, about the quitting comedy thing. Um, that was a theatrical device. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I said that I was quitting comedy the same way that Louis C.K. said he was sorry. I didn't mean it. <laughs> Um, look, <laughs> look to, cut it, to cut it short, um, what I'm, when I was talking about jo you know, humour is uh, used to diffuse tension and that's why we have it, that's why we all have a sense of humour, that's why we all need it. Uh, but in an unequal world, it's, very, it's next to impossible for somebody to stand in front of the world and us to share the same sense of humour and the same tensions. It's an unequal world, so it's unfair to assume that everyone in this room shares the same tensions. So I believe, you know, when you're on stage, when you have uh, the loudest voice in the room, I think you have a responsibility to care and to be careful. Um, but what I was doing with Nanette is what I decided was more important. Uh, which was to address the function of humour, which is to diffuse tension, which is to offer catharsis. So the, it's not a funny show. If you haven't seen it, don't go, must watch it. Ah. You won't, it's not that. But what, I was, what, I, what, what the point of Nanette was, was to do what often humour doesn't do, which is provide catharsis for everybody. Because in this world, mm. you know, if you, if you subscribe to comedy in the purest form, then Donald Trump is a great comedian. You know, he got a whole stadium full of people to laugh at a victim of sexual assault. That, you know, he's done the job. He's done the job of comedy. But I, I believe catharsis is, is more important mm -hmm. than, than the punchline. Um, I d that's the thing I've said. I'm not sure if I answered your question, um, but we'll, we'll just pretend I did, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, Jill, you're yeah. also involved. <laughs> oh. Hi. Why don't you wrap this thing up? <laughs> uh, yeah, we uh, have to leave. Um, uh, so we did, <laughs> did, we, are we, did we get the sign? That, are we done? Or yeah. Are we, is it no more? Yeah, they're being really signing. They said no more. Yeah, that's time's it. up. Oh. Boy, guys. <laughs> This has been really fun. Well, I, I, I'd love to see you afterwards, and I, I look forward to sharing some of the ideas in the book with the world and with you guys. So thank you guys so much for being thank here tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.